Okay, so thank you to everyone who's um, coming to my talk. Um, I've been to ISMB for a number of years, and this is the first opportunity I have to speak, so I hope you enjoy. I'm going to lower this down a little bit. I've been told to tell you that the EBI is at booth six, so it's your last chance today to stop by if you have any questions. I also have a poster presentation uh, if you are interested to have a look at that after the session. Okay, let's get started then. So, my talk is entitled uh, Designing with the User in Mind, how UCD, or user-centered design, can work for bioinformatics. Now, let me just define UCD from my perspective before we begin. It's basically an approach that grounds the design process in information about the people who will use that service or product or tool. So it's very much a social thing and a people thing, as you'll see during my talk. Just to introduce myself, um, I work at the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is near Cambridge, as I guess you guys know. There's quite a few of us around here um, at, at this particular event. I'm a user experience analyst. Um, my background is actually in proteomic bioinformatics um, in the pharma industry. But for the last three and a half years, I've actually been working with end users of EBI tools to improve their usability, um, hence the job title user experience analyst. I tweet at Jennifer Cam also if you're interested in following up with me after the, after the session. Okay, so the story for this talk begins back in 2010 at the ISMB stand in Boston. This was a popular stand because we were next to the TV screens and the World Cup was happening, um, so it was um, a premium position. This was a few minutes later in the view out of my hotel room. Spain won the World Cup, so they were celebrating in the water. But actually, <clears throat> what happened was I got into a conversation with somebody at the stand. Um, stands are great for that. Uh, this was Anna Divoli. We were chatting about user experience and, and her, um, her, her experience of trying to do user-centered design methods. Um, and we both agreed that we need to publish more about this particular type of work, about user experience, for bioinformatics specifically. Because there is very little in the literature that brings the user experience community and the bioinformatics community together. So, um, that's what we did. At the EBI, um, we've recently uh, published these two papers uh, about user-centered design in bioinformatics. The first article there, 2012 uh, in PLOS Computational Biology, is more of an opinion and perspective piece uh, which walks you through the topics in general, whereas the paper I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail uh, in this particular talk uh, is a case study that we published this year on the enzyme portal. Um, which I hope you'll have a look at. So uh, my mission really today, as I walk you through that particular paper, is to give you some food for thought. I'd like you to think about your users. Why, why, why is it important to think about users first before you develop uh, a tool or an application or a service of any kind? So have you thought about that before? Is user-centered design something specifically you have written in your um, proposals when you, when you are, are designing tools, for example? I feel it's important for us to think about it because it's pretty much recognized that bioinformatics services do suffer from usability issues. I hope you don't want to argue about that because uh, think, about, think about the websites that people use in their daily lives. I mean, you, you can really think about, okay, so Facebook, I've put a few on here, but these are the experiences people are having daily with these services, and then they come to use bioinformatics services, perhaps in their research, perhaps they're a bench biologist, and they're faced with these really difficult, often, frankly, ugly services. There are many reasons why that's happened, and I'm not blaming anybody specifically, but it's something we need to be aware of. And I've put a couple of references down there, bottom right-hand side, of other people who have looked in, at this. I mean, Jav Javaheri um, et al, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but um, they, they literally say they lack sophistication compared to other tools, bioinformatics tools lack sophistication. And Bolcini showed, uh, using some tasks, that people could not complete what they wanted to do on the bioinformatics service due to the usability issues. So it isn't just me that thinks this. 
We have challenges in our community to, to put users first, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's easy. So I'll just quickly uh, go through these challenges, and then I'll look at some solutions of how we can address it. But challenges include balancing the scalability and the complex nature of the data we have with pleasing the user. Balancing that is not an easy thing for us to do. We also, especially at the EBI, have this huge scale of users from dry computational command line driven stuff that people want to use, who, who, who are computational scientists, all the way through to um, infrequent users of services who are bench biologists, for example, and just want to get things done. And to find this kind of sweet spot where the two uh, user communities meet in a single uh, interface or tool is very difficult. Um, also, measuring the benefits of user-centered design can be hard because we don't sell stuff. The UX community is a huge community in itself. And if I go to UX conferences, for example, that they will be able to demonstrate tangible increases in sales or um, profit or whatever as a result of their user-centered design projects. We don't really have that. My metric for success is things like fewer help requests or it's, it's very intangible. I mean, how do you measure um, scientific discovery? How, how much a tool affects scientific discovery? So that's a challenge also. Finding the people can be tricky. Um, this particular article I've highlighted there in, in the yellow says um, a lack of formal domain expertise can be a significant hurdle for carrying out effective usability evaluations and achieving usability in complex domains. Some fundamental educational changes may be needed in training usability professionals. So finding somebody who wants to do both things interested in bioinformatics, interested in user-centered design or user experience, um, having, having the mix of skills and the desire in that individual can be difficult to find. And we've, um, there are three people working in user experience um, analysis, specifically in user experience design at the EBI. And I've found myself in recruitment to um, an interviews uh, that this can be an issue, finding the people. But nevertheless, so we know those are all the challenges, but we decided to have a go. And it's, yeah, it kind of looks like this. It's, you're moving yourself away from the computer, you're doing a lot of work and um, post-it notes and a lot of uh, interaction with users. So we, we tend to focus on three main things when we, when we approach a user-centered design project. So I've written those three here, and then I'll explain three more specific examples and give you um, a bit more detail in a moment. So we want to characterize our users and their requirements. Quite often, say, service providers at the EBI will come to speak to me and say, look, we're really interested in improving the usability of our service. And I will ask them, OK, so who are your users? Um, they don't always know. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but it's true. It's not always the first thing people think of. They might be thinking of other things, like where are we going to get the data from, um, what developers do we have, and lots of other things. So it's characterizing those users and their requirements, and there are techniques to do that. Next is once you have an, a handle on who those people are, how do you design suitable, suitable interactions for those people? So that, that can be on a huge spectrum, so it, it could be, you know, three blobs. You can do this, this, and this on a, on a graphical user interface or a web page um, for people who come very infrequently, yeah? Or it, and the interface may be extremely advanced settings, a command line element, whatever. But it just needs, to, those interactions need to fit with point one, who those users are. And the final thing, uh, it's not big, not scary, not necessarily expensive, but testing a prototype of what you've done. And I will show you, we even do that on paper uh, or using PowerPoint. Okay, so that's those three steps are the basic things. I'm going to give you a little walkthrough of that case study that's in that 2013 paper of ours. So we used a new service uh, called Enzyme Portal. So previously, um, there were many services that had enzyme-related uh, information, but they were loosely hyperlinked. And so the brief for this new service in, in the proposal was to put together an integrated report of embedded information. So enzyme researchers or people interested in receptors with enzymatic activity 
could easily find that information in one place. So that was kind of the brief. And these are just a couple of screenshots of what we came up, came up with. This talk, I don't have scope to show you this service. If you're interested, please come and see me afterwards. I'm just going to focus on how we got to this point. So we have this uh, figure in our paper. I know it looks kind of big, but this is we, we did a full user-centered design life cycle just to demonstrate what's possible if you really want to do it properly for a bioinformatics project. But I'm going to show you the three elements that I think you can get away with more or less as the minimum, which are um, user profiles, some workshops or user, user focus groups, and some prototype testing. Now, it, the steps, all of the steps are important. So stakeholder requirements is important. User profiles, interviews, etc. I, I, would, I would suggest looking at all of these. But due to the time constraints I have now and probably the, the resource and time constraints you have, I'm just going to focus on those three. So user profiles or personae uh, for empathy. You are not the user. Yeah, this is a fact. It's very, very, very rare that you would find somebody just like you who's going to use the thing you're developing. Yeah, they have different interests to you. They have a different background. They're a different person. So just because you think, mm, I think the box would look good here, and I think this, they're really going to want to do this, those, fair enough, are something to work on, but they're based on your assumptions as you living in your life. Um, that does not necessarily help you understand what the user wants from your service. Okay, so that's what we, okay, so we, if we accept that, what do we actually do about it? Well, we use a user profile or a persona to mitigate this self as user outlook. And there are, um, I'm no expert in psychology um, and theories, but there's this empathizing, systemizing theory, which also says, uh, uh, from this chap called Baron Cohen, um, who says uh, that if you're really good at systemizing, so if programming, putting together a logical algorithm, you tend not to be that good at empathizing with other people's feelings. Right? Okay, it's not always the case, but there's data in this paper of his that shows that this, this is an issue. So um, using, this, using a persona can actually help people who are good systemizers working in your team to empathize. I just wanted to mention, Bar S. Baron Cohen might ring a bell. This, um, this is Sasha Baron Cohen. Apparently, this is his cousin. But um, he doesn't have papers on, um, on user profiles. But anyway, um, Ali G. So this is a basic thing. It's a really straightforward thing. So this is one of the profiles we use for the Enzyme Portal uh, paper and case study. It's a person that has a specific name, a specific set of motivations or needs. If you, have, if, if you think of an individual, it's much easier to empathise than with people. I mean, the media and, and, and um, <coughs> marketing people, they know about this already. You're much more likely to latch on to a, per, a real person and, and if you know their story than if you are just thinking about all of those people. You know, people in pharma are going to use this. Well, no, you need to think about who, who is it specifically. This is an example of a bit more fleshed out uh, user profile that we used for the EBI website redesign. So you've got information here about their motivation. You've got this little scale on the bottom left hand, which is how wet and dry they are, if you remember the graph I did earlier, which is kind of important. Um, once you have this information, so this, this kind of allows you to map out a person's user story as well. Perhaps you know what, what information they have to start with before they come to your service or tool, and what information they want to go away with. And once you have, these, have this, you can put together a sort of a task analysis map, which we did for the Enzyme Portal, and you can find this in the paper. You've got that person's motivations, what information they have, and then, then when, you, when you map them onto a single um, diagram, you can then easily see where those major hubs are, where several users are going to come through. And then you can really focus your attention on designing those well. Okay, so I haven't got a lot of time to go into that sort of workflow analysis. I'm going to move on to workshops, which is the second thing. So workshops are great for um, 
understanding more detail about what people need. <coughs> and you can use your user profile that I just showed you to identify suitable individuals to invite to a workshop. So you make sure that those are represented. And I, I didn't mention, but I would suggest only having two or three user profiles at absolute most. So this is a normal meeting. Um, people are sitting back in their chairs. They're sort of looking round. They're thinking, where shall I go on holiday? What shall I make for dinner? This is a meeting. I would suggest not having a meeting. I would suggest having a game storming workshop or a focus group where you see it's totally different body language. People are leaning forwards. They're interested in what's on the table. Um, so for a focus group, I, I, this particular one for Enzyme Portal, we had a lot of things we needed to know from users in a short amount of time. So sitting back in your chairs and looking out of the window is not going to get that. So we designed specific activities to prioritise data items, to understand the navigation that we're going to have on the Enzyme Portal, and really just flesh out some of those initial ideas that we had from user profiles. And I didn't mention also, but we did interviews for, to make sure our user profiles were correct. I, I say game storming, that's not my word, it's, it's um, from the book which I thoroughly recommend, which is a reference book of workshop activities. Some of them are a bit kooky for scientists, um, but others are really good. So um, I, I would definitely have that on your shelf if you're thinking of doing this kind of thing with users. So anyway, so we did uh, our own bespoke card sorting activity. Card sorting is basically a, it's a user experience method where you want to understand which data items you should group together and what, you, what label you should give them. So for menu structures and for information architecture of a website, you can use that. Um, we, we actually we didn't do the standard card sorting method. We used a canvas. <coughs> which looked like this. So we had uh, a blank canvas, but just the uh, template drawn out. We got people to select from a vast amount of data items that we prepared on cards, select just six or seven of those, and they had to vote on which ones were most important in their team if they didn't agree. So those went in the top left-hand box. Then we had actions down the side, on the, on the, on the right-hand side. That's um, your functionalities. So what do I actually want to do with those data items? Well, I want to run sequence analysis. I want to export it. I want to whatever. And bottom left-hand um, is the navigation. So where will you have been before you come to these data items, and where do you want to go next? Yeah, so, um, so that worked really well. And so in the space of maybe an hour, hour and a half, we much better understood which items of information people wanted on the Enzyme portal in the initial pages. Okay, so finally, this is my last um, uh, part on this, uh, on the figure from the paper that I'm going to show you. It's usability testing. This is basically evaluating a prototype or your initial design ideas and seeing them in action. For Enzyme portal, we used a paper prototyping approach where we took the canvases from the workshop and put together some basic designs in a tool called Balsamic, which uh, here's another screenshot from that. Um, it's, a, it's a commercial tool, but I thoroughly recommend it, and you can get bulk licenses for it to reduce the cost, which the EBI has done. But yeah, so we, so we uh, put together the bits of the interface that we wanted to, to bolt together and filled it with some real data, and that's really important. Just go back to this slide. Um, in a usability test or a paper prototyping approach, what you need to do is have a scenario and a task. A scenario is, imagine you ran a gene expression experiment, uh, you found that these two genes were overexpressed, they correspond to enzymes. Task, find out what these enzymes are, if there's a 3D structure for them, blah, blah, blah. So you've got a really tangible thing, often with a bit of data or a bit of information, and then a task for them to complete. And then you just sit back very quietly, and you need to sometimes, you know, muzzle software developers who have, have if you're doing an interactive test with their software, um, not to say anything. Um, sit very, very quietly and watch what the user does. You give them a pen instead of a mouse, obviously, if you're doing um, paper prototyping. And they very soon forget that it's paper. They do start interacting with it like it's a web page, which is quite interesting to watch. Um, 
And when they click on a button, then you've got a printout of the next screen and you just flip it over. Yeah, and, 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 and do it like that. What's really good about this approach is because it's low fidelity, people aren't giving you lots of feedback about, oh, I think the button should be orange, not red, or I think this typeface is a bit ugly. They're not focusing on that. They're actually looking at what the data is and the journey through the site, which is much more helpful than when you've got an aesthetically finished prototype. Okay, so those are the three things I wanted just to highlight. As I mentioned, if you want more detail, it's all in the paper. Okay, thanks. So, um, what did we learn from this process? This is just a summing up bit of my talk, just to, to give you something to think about. We learned uh, specific things uh, about enzymes, about enzyme information, about what, uh, what researchers in those fields wanted. But we also learned general things about presenting information on bioinformatics websites. Um, I, rec I reckon in most projects, if you do this kind of approach, you'll find both of those things. If you want a list of those, they're in the paper. I personally feel that usability does determine how our community is perceived. And this is a quote from a paper at the bottom. Um, there are scientists who publish work but do not want to go to the trouble of making the resources easy to use. Wouldn't it seem that evidence of usability should be prerequisite to publishing a paper about such a resource? I feel it should and I feel it's our duty to return um, on public investment that's gone into the research or into the infrastructure to make those services available, I think it's our duty to improve the usability of the services. And some people are working towards this already. I'm just trying to show you ways that you may, may be able to do that and achieve it. I found in particular positive aspects of user-centered design are that you have tangible evidence from users about how a service is working, how, it, how, it, how it's going in action. And, and this can be very useful for communicating to management and the software developers about your project. It makes your decisions a lot easier. It's not just, I think it should look like this. It's, I've gathered evidence from eight users and seven out of eight of them couldn't complete the task. That's much more compelling evidence than just your opinion on what things should look like. And also there's a teamwork ethos that I've found that's, that's happened. The software developers are really interested uh, quite often in, in having feedback from users. They want to know that the effort that they're going to to create something is really meeting a need. And because you've got UX people, software developers, you've got lots of people involved together working as a team throughout. For this to happen though, I think, um, culture change is needed. And this could come from the bottom up or the top down. Bottom up, it could come from us as a community, getting interest and momentum together for user experience. We have a, an Interfaces community which you can engage with through this particular blog, WordPress blog, at the EBI. But also, I think, higher level culture change, it's really about lobbying um, research councils and funders to say that, look, I, I don't think this proposal is ready until you've explicitly said that you're going to speak to users about your resource. And that's it. So I realise I'm the last talk before lunch, so um, I don't want to keep you from your sandwiches. These were the sandwiches in Boston. They, had, they were pretty awesome. Um, if you're interested in having a sketch note, so sketch notes is my big thing I'm interested in. So I've been sketch noting every talk that I've been to whilst I've been at ISMB. But when I, when I practice this talk with my colleagues back at the EBI, um, one of my colleagues did this sketch note of my talk. So if you want a copy of this, I've got handouts on the table over there, or I'll be putting it on my personal blog, which is written there. Um, I'd like to thank everybody at the EBI. In particular, this is the Enzyme Portal team uh, under Chris Steinbeck. And thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. Questions? I, I guess I have a question again about scalability. So we have huge numbers of tools. Many of the tools have not been developed by having large user communities in mind, but many, many of the tools have a life cycle where basically 
tools are being done for in-house use for very focal use it turns out they're nice uh, and then they go into the community piece by piece um, this uh, is very nice but it's also quite effortsome so we couldn't possibly do this as a first step on all the tools so how would you suggest when is the decision being taken it turns it, it seems that often we'd be too late you know uh, to 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 build a tool from scratch with the users in mind for many of the tools so how do we solve that that conundrum mm. okay so, so what i would say is even if you sit down with three two three people in the canteen with some printouts of your initial ideas you will learn so much from that in 20 30 minutes that you won't believe it um, and you it will open your eyes to how you easy easy wins to improve the usability of what you're doing um, you can even do it remotely so if you're talking about a small user community that's geographically diverse then you can also do it over skype or there are other there are other usability um, platforms that allow remote testing as well um, just have a go it isn't really expensive and it isn't really okay. time consuming in this big wins. So you really suggest to do it on every tool yeah well I, th I think you've probably got half a day to spare even if it's a small okay. tool and okay. I think it's worthwhile if, if people are going to use it 